Okay, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you know a little bit of my background. Uh, I've been around a long time. Uh, my, about my first 25 years, I worked in the aerospace industry, uh, like uh, Titan, Atlas, ballistic missile programs, and space programs, and so I have a pretty good knowledge, technical knowledge. And in my last 25 years, I've been in the uh, uh, public area, uh, ending up as a uh, head of operations of Los Angeles uh, Metro Transit Authority and then general manager of Orange County Transit. So I kind of have a mix of public and private and uh, a lot of uh, managerial type activities, which uh, kind of is my bag. I, I really enjoy that. So anyhow, um, I just want to, it's been kind of exciting for me the last couple of months. I talked with JJ. I just got back from a trip from uh, starting in uh, uh, Portugal, doing the Douro River, and going down the uh, west coast of Africa. And I uh, cruised down there and hitting 12 different countries in Africa, ending up in Cape Town and over to Victoria Falls. And that, I tell you, was a, a marvelous, really marvelous trip. And, and one of the things that uh, kind of learned through that experience, if you find someone that really doesn't like what's going on in this country, tell them to go over to Ghana for a while <laughs> and, and live there and, and see what happens. They will love it here, I tell you. So that's, uh, and, and going over there and seeing all those African countries, uh, if you're not an entrepreneur, you don't live over there. Because you know if you have to base anything on you know, what the country or the government's gonna give you, you're gonna be dead. And uh, so, it, just think about being an entrepreneur in that environment versus the environment you have here. I mean, I tell you, you're lucky to be in this environment. And not only in, uh, you know, Ghana, I, I've been fortunate in the last 30 years to really travel all over the world. And in good places, you know, like, you know, obviously Africa, India, Egypt, and places like that, seeing like in, in Cairo, where the you know families live over the graves of their ancestors, it's, it's how they live. So being an entrepreneur in that environment, as well as Cuba, Cuba is really interesting. And um, it, it, what what's really interesting is that the people in those environments, I mean, that's what they have, and they're happy doing it. Uh, Cuba, like 80 to 90 percent of their uh, 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 economy is, is based on really kind of the black market. And if you're not an entrepreneur there, again, you're just not succeeding. But they, they live in that environment and they work in that environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell you, I just, uh, again, be happy. You're blessed being here. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit that, talk about what impacted me when I really got into uh, my serious business activities. Um, and I, I got a lot to say. I'm going to try not to wander too much, but it's kind of that reminds me a little bit of a story. I was at a seminar with Peter Drucker, you know, a few years back, and he said, "Well, uh, I'm going to lecture, but uh, keep me on track, so that." Uh, <laughs> and I kind of like good luck with him. He's talking, and all of a sudden he, he's saying, "Oh yeah, I was with uh, having lunch with uh, Queen Elizabeth." And Big Ben just struck 215. You know, he has total recall about you know the things that he has been doing over the years, and, and talk about a uh, interesting person. Uh, that was that was really something. But anyhow, uh, when I got serious about business, uh, I kind of went on a knowledge quest. Uh, you know, books, uh, lectures, seminars, articles, and the first major impact uh, on me was from uh, Tom Peters. A book in search of excellence. Uh, I don't know if you read that uh, years back, and uh, it really got me thinking. And uh, later, I was able. I went to a uh, summer program at Stanford Graduate School of Management, and there again I met Tom Peters, and uh, really just uh, talk about a thinker. And then I was able. I went to skunk camp. I, he used to run a skunk camp up in Northern California. That was based upon kind of. Uh, uh, Lockheed's uh, Skunk Works back during uh, the war, as you probably read a little bit about that, where they did advanced research and uh, really some exciting stuff. Well, anyhow, uh, I'm at Skunk Camp and we were doing case, uh, case studies. And we had uh, people from all over the whole world. 
and we were assigned case studies, and uh, we'd come back make presentations. Well, in our group, uh, I, I started talking about uh, how we're doing, and I said, we got to get people involved with our presentation. Uh, people is where all this stuff goes, uh, dealing with people. And I got resistance, you know, we, we just want to work the case, we want to talk about working with people or anything like that. Well, you know, I persisted and got in it. We made our presentation for the group, and then afterwards, uh, Tom came up, he says, wow, he said, that's really interesting. He said that in all the case studies we had here, yours were the only group that talked about people involvement in, in, in getting the job done. And I'm kind of going, well, I guess, you know, I kind of, I kind of won that one. But uh, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use more of that, people involved, but with some of my next books. And that made me feel pretty good because, again, uh, uh, people, I think, is where it's, where it's all at. Uh, another one that uh, impacted me, I ran into, uh, this was at, I was at Emory University School of Theology. I ran into the writings of Robert Greenleaf on servant leadership. And that was interesting. And, and that was all about, again, you're working with people, you're a manager working with people, how do you work with them? You help them, you're a servant to them. And, and throughout my whole career, when I was with Orange County and when, with, uh, when I was with uh, Los Angeles, I talked to the managers and I'd say, you know, uh, a lot of times you have new managers, they think that they should tell everyone what to do. Uh, really kind of be a dictator. You, don't want to, you want to help those people. You want to be a servant to them. So that's a whole concept of servant leadership. And I think it's extremely important, helping others. Another one that impacted me was Margaret Wheatley. And uh, she talked uh, basic, about the basic principles, how they affect life, like the quantum theory, okay, the principles that dictate how the university is run. And she, her whole idea was that there are also principles that affect people, uh, principles and values that affect people, how it affects each of us in our daily life and in our work life. And that kind of really turned me on more. And the, the largest impact that I have was with, uh, with Stephen Covey, uh, the author that uh, Seven Habits of you know, Highly Effective uh, People. and. Uh, he also ran a program in Orange County that I thought was just really interesting. He called it the master managers. And what we'd have, there'd be a, um, a management guru would write a book, and then we'd get the book, and then a month later he'd come in and lecture. So we got to read the book, and then we got to ask questions from that, you know, that manager why, you know, uh, and it was like about a 10 or 11 month program, so reading like, uh, ten books and then having lectures again and you being able to talk to him. Just ex the format was just extremely, extremely interesting. And uh, one of the other books that uh, that he wrote was Principle Centered Leadership. And I think that was one of his best books because there he's talking about uh, principles and values. And in dealing people, that's uh, 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 that's 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 really great. And, and the, uh, I was also able, and he since passed away, able to spend some hours talking with him when he was in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, brilliant. And, and I spent some time uh, up with him. He had a, uh, a leadership course up in Utah and also talked about uh, principal center leadership was part of that, that whole thing. And here recently, uh, I guess the last uh, few months or so, I uh, was a judge at an international speech contest, and they had uh, people from, uh, you know, young people from really all over the whole world, and I got to talk to them. And one of the questions I asked them, I says, which comes first, uh, principles or values? And I got some very, very interesting answers. And I, and I talked to them, you know, which, which comes first, you know, principles or values? I don't know how you think, how, how you, you look at that. And the way I explain that, I say that if you got a gangbanger in, say, in East L.A., he has a value to his gang, he'll go out and kill to protect his gang. He does not have the principle, do not kill. So my take, principles comes first, 
than values. And you think about it that way. And uh, So where do principles come from? Uh, inside. Inside you as a person. You have to decide what your principles are. It depends upon a lot of things. And you have to understand yourself. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of understanding yourself and then how you then relate to other people. But it, it all, to me, comes on individuals in interacting with others. Uh, and it's about people getting involved. Uh, I remember when I first became general manager of Orange County, um, I'm the general manager, I should know it all. I should, you know, and so I'm giving uh, presentations up to the, we're on a DS, I'm up here with my board and my uh, uh, staff down here, my department heads. So I'm making the presentations and, and I can see the uh, my department heads kind of looking around saying, oh, you know, this is so boring. It's kind of like when I was coaching Little League and my right feeler would be chasing butterflies while we're playing the game. That's kind of, kind of felt how, how the uh, my department heads were doing. What I did, I made a change. I From now on, I said, from your department, you're making the presentations. And, uh, and then where we needed action from the board, then they would tell what they needed, what type of action. It was one of the best changes ever. I got them involved. And they not only got involved, they took interest in things, and I got a little competition going because each of the my uh, uh, staff directors tried to outdo each other by making better presentations. And that was one of the best things I did to get them involved in that whole organization. And it, it's about, um, uh, also it's about communications. Um, my son owns a, uh, like a small business uh, uh, insurance company. And uh, he's talking to me one time saying that, uh, well, my staff doesn't do what, really doing what I want them to do. And I said, well, have you really told them? Have you already sat down? Are you really, are you really communicating with them to let them know what you want? And he said that, well, probably not. So that's what you got to do. And I remember uh, George Bernard Shaw said that the greatest problem in communications is the illusion it has been accomplished. And there's so much in that. You think you've got it done, but it's not really there. You have to uh, really make sure that you're being understand, understood. And I, I remember when I was back as the general manager at uh, Orange County, I had consultants would come in and I asked them, how can we improve our organization? And well, they'd give me different suggestions, but I always get the answer back. You need to improve communications in your company. You need to improve communications. I said, well, that's great. How do you do it? No one could tell me. Not one, and, and these were big eight, you know what I mean, consulting companies and, uh, you know, big time. They couldn't tell me how to improve communications. Well, I finally figured it out for myself. And uh, what it really amounts to is that if you have people with similar good principles and values, okay, good similar principles and values, it creates trust. And when you trust someone, communications flow. So you think about that. It's communications flow when you trust an individual. That's how you do it. It's it, it actually very simple in terms of looking at it that way. It's about communications, understanding, and accountability. And, uh, and by accountability, I mean at some point in time, uh, you're gonna have to fire somebody. Somebody has to go because they're not getting the job done. I remember occasions, and that's tough to do. Mm, bet it is. And it, it's really tough. And I, it, my, my son, this is a company, he said, he had the gal that's not doing it. I said, you got to get rid of her. I can't. Oh, yeah, yes, you can. You better because they're not getting the job. I've had senior executives in my office crying because I'm telling them that, hey, they're not getting the job done. You've got to go. Now, hard on me, I'd go home that time and have, you know, maybe a couple of toddies you know, before dinner because uh, it takes a lot out of you. And, uh, and it should, because you're talking about a person's life. And, uh, and you don't ever try to destroy them, just say, I think you'd be better off in some other, you know, some other uh, job uh, along the way. And, and, it's, and it's tough to do. When I was uh, up in LA, I uh, was there a couple of times, the head of operations, they had problems, I came in, you know, tried to fix things for them. 
one of the times I left and I'm, I'm talking to the CEO then about, hey, you've got some deadwood here that a couple of guys that uh, they should not be here. They should, they're not getting the job done. Oh, okay, okay. I saw him about a year later. He said, you know, I wish I would listen to you earlier. He said, I finally got rid of that one guy. He said it was a big problem here. I should have done it earlier. But it's tough to do. It's, it, I mean, it's really tough. Um, uh, anyway, th th getting back to some of the entrepreneurship, there's a, a book I recently read about Phil Knight, how he started Nike. It, uh, the book is Shoe Dog. I don't know if any of you have read that, but it's yeah. very interesting. And uh, it, it's recently, I, I think it's out in the last, uh, last six months or so. And talk about perseverance and persistence. Reading that, I almost got tired how persistent he was. And to be an entrepreneur, you have to be so persistent. I mean, it's just unbelievable. If I was him, I would have given up, you know, uh, eight or ten times. But he persisted, and, and guess where he is now? I mean, he's not doing too bad. So uh, uh, it's another thing, a book that's an older book about uh, leadership, which managing leadership uh, a uh, book about endurance about Ernest Shackleton bringing his guys out of his uh, shipwreck in uh, Antarctica. Uh, if you ever read that one, it's fascinating. And that was happening around about 1914, 1917. And I heard, you know, I talked to some people about that, uh, some criticism about him being a dictator. I said, well, some, you don't have to be a, you know, a bad dictator, but sometimes you have to have some strength to get results. And with the problems that they had, he brought all his people back without anyone dying. It's just, to me, it's just, uh, uh, just unbelievable in terms of what can be done if you're strong. Um, okay, and a little bit back, back to business. I think about business in terms of a business cycle, uh, and that includes making changes. And uh, to make change, you have to have some uh, data points. Uh, what are you measuring in terms of business? What are you trying to accomplish? And I hope each of you in what you're trying to do has some key performance factors that you're tracking. Because if you're not, you're, you're not going to be able to find out what's happening. Because you look at those factors and you look at the trends associated with them and see how the trends are going up or to, how do you want the trends to go down? You know, it, like in the transit business, we have some, some key factors, you know, what's your cost per mile, you know, cost per passenger, you know, how many maintenance people you have for buses, what's your on-time performance. And we're tracking all those things at the same time. For your businesses, you have to know what your key factors are and you have to track those. And then when you track them and see how they're going, you have to make changes. And that's a continual cycle. Some people would do it. I, I talked to some of the transit managers say to me, well, how's your... How are you doing? Well, they kick a tire and everything's going fine. They didn't know what was going on. They're not tracking anything. Track it, find out what the trends are, and make changes. And that's a continuous cycle. Continue with track and continue, continue to make the changes. If you're not, you're, gonna, you're not going to succeed. It, it, it's just that simple. And uh, so, so measure those. And I look at uh, a business in terms of people, technology, and resources. Uh, there's a show in uh, CNBC now called The Profit. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It, it's really an interesting show. And, uh, you know, uh, he goes out, uh, as one as he, he fixes, you know, new and old businesses. And he looks at it, a business in terms of people, process, and profit. And, uh, but if you get a chance to see that, it's really interesting. So tonight I'm going to talk about... Uh, really primarily the people element because I think it's extremely important. And uh, I'm going to talk about it in terms of knowing yourself and that's uh, in what roles you want to have and relationships, managerial and leadership characteristics, and then really, you know, kind of how you keep the whole thing going. So the first one, talking about knowing yourself. And that's doing yourself in terms of asking yourself, what are your principles and values? And that's obviously based up on your experience, your education, uh, you know, uh, your parents or your family, everything that makes you who you are. But you need to understand who you are in order to understand other people. And I talk about in terms of principles, values, trust, communications, 
And then you go on with communications and interest, interest that you have. Then you develop friendships. And that, to me, that's what it's all about. So, you know, who you are and what makes you tick, and that's your principles and values. And knowing yourself, uh, to understand that you have to remain focused on what you're going to do. Uh, become knowledgeable uh, on where you're at. Uh, need to understand uh, what you're into and the knowledge of what you're trying to succeed from entrepreneurship. How much knowledge you have in that area. And you can't get enough knowledge, I have to tell you. You never get enough knowledge. You have to you keep learning more and learning more and learning more. And with that, you need to have a strong work ethic. If you don't have that, you're not to go to six Ds. And being patient, adaptable, and humble. A little bit of humble, some of the people like we have in Washington now, and uh, the humbleness of some of our leaders. That's, uh, we won't talk too much about that. But, uh, and you need to feel good about yourself, be confident about yourself in terms of what you're doing and what you're going to accomplish. Now, in order to do that, again, you have to continually educate you. I'm not going to say, I'm going to talk about that more about educating yourself, educating yourself. I can go back in my time going back to college and everything. I mean, I wish I would have gone, you know, taken all the classes I could there. You, you, sometimes you try to get by. You just try to suck up as much knowledge as you can. So continually educate yourself and do the best you're capable of doing. And I think that's so key. I had John Wooden over at uh, the Transit District uh, one time when he was giving us a talk. And uh, we had breakfast together. Any anyway, of you know, I mean, uh, I mean, you know about John Wood. He is one of the most gentleman's gentlemen I have ever met. And we're talking at breakfast. And he looked at me, he says, you know, Jim, he said, uh, I never told my boys, I mean, his boys, he called his boys, his basketball players, to win. I never told them to win. I told them, I want you to do the best you're capable of doing. And think about that. Think about the onus that, who's that put that on? Or are you doing the best you're capable of doing? I was at a, uh, a Bible study class uh, uh, one day. We had a group of us from church, and, and one of the uh, uh, one of the men there was talking about, "Oh, all this happens. This was terrible, and this is awful." And I says, "Wait!" And he was just really eating himself up. I said, stop. Wait a minute. I said, "Stop." In that situation. In those circumstances, did you do the best you're capable of doing? He stopped. He thought a while. I said, yeah. I said, what are you beating yourself up about? In that situation, if you did the best you're capable of doing, what else you could have done? You couldn't have done anything. Oh, he thought about that. And I, I've used that with others. It made him feel better. He came out of his doldrums and came out, okay, I feel better now. Doing it. Well, that's, that's what it's all Do the best you're capable of doing. And the other thing is uh, you have to prioritize uh, your actions. Uh, when things happen, I mean, you get, you're, you're, you're going 50 different directions at once. How do you get anything done? You can't get anything done. You have to prioritize. Uh, and my son, he comes, I'm, I'm his business consultant. He got all these things going on. Well, how are you going to handle it? How do you eat an apple one bite at a time? Okay, prioritize. Look what's important, get that done then do the next one, then do the next one. If you worry about everything at once, you're not going to get anything done. And that, it's quite simple. It just won't, won't happen. And uh, uh, you have to take the initiative of anything, being strong and persistent. You have to exercise self-control. You have to do this yourself. Keep your promises. You know, how many people give phone calls? Do you return your phone calls promptly? Is that your reputation, yes or no? It should be you, you return call, your calls promptly. And that should be your reputation. If not, you better get a new reputation because that's what it's all. And find humor. It, it, it also, I've seen so many people, they got this hour look on their face. You know, they never have a happy smile. Have fun in life. You know, life is short. You know, take advantage of it. Now, the second way to talk about developing relationships, working with other people. I talked about trust. You have to be trustworthy, uh, caring, and reliable. And how is your character? You have integrity. I mean, is that, that's part of the whole thing. And one of the things that uh, Stephen Covey said that uh, I really, I think, hits it right on. Most people would rather work on their personality than on their character. The former may include learning a new skill, style, or image. 
but the latter involves changing habits, developing virtues, disciplining appetites and passions, and keeping promise and being considerate of the feelings and convictions of others. Character development is the best manifestation of our maturity. That kind of says it all. You think about it there. Character, integrity, character, integrity, that's strong. That, that's where he should be at. And, and be sincere and respectable with it and courteous and gentle. And that courteous and gentle is very interesting. I call that Pygmalion management. In George Bernard Shaw, when uh, uh, Eliza Doolittle, well, Doolittle was explaining to Colonel Pickering, you remember that scene? What did she say? I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins because he always treats me as a flower girl and always will. But I know I can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady and always will. So how do you treat others? How do you treat others? That's Pygmalion management. I mean, and that again, I mean, it's there. How do you treat others? Now, in order to develop these relationships, what you need to do. Be truthful, trust people, love others, be fair, act consistently, forgive, and follow the golden rule. You know, it, it's not that difficult. You, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. And I can go, with, you know, starting with, you know, your similar uh, uh, principles and value, values, developing trust, improving communications, then you have continuing that, you have people with similar interests, you have friendships, and you follow that line up all the way through, starting with principles of values, that could lead to marriage. You know, how, how do you select your mate? How do you, how do you select your friendships? Okay? Principles, it all starts with principles of values. Now I want to talk a little bit about managerial and leadership characteristics and, and looking at what role you want, to be a worker bee, uh, to be an entrepreneur or whatever. Uh, you set your goals and object objectives. Uh, you establish your vision. Uh, you set standards. You better have standards of high integrity and quality. If not, you're not going to succeed. And sometimes, sometimes it takes a little extra work to establish that quality. But you, you go to restaurants. restaurants. Why do restaurants fail? I mean, they may be going real well for a while, and then what happens? Their quality goes down. And that's the worst thing that can happen. And then you, after a while, you're, you, you're no longer in business. So if you want to be business, you better have good quality. Otherwise, you do something else. Uh, and you have to create value in your, comp when you, your, act your entrepreneur, entrepreneurship activities. Are you creating value, accomplishments, and satisfactions for others? If you're not, you better get, get into some other place. Uh, and be a cheerleader and a servant leader, and that's the idea of, again, helping others that, I, that I've talked to. And be consistent. The worst thing you can do is uh, you're out working with people and you're inconsistent. Consistency will help you get it done. And if you're not consistent, you're going to lose people along the way. So you've got to think of and have fun. And, uh, uh, and, and, and working with people and, and trying to touch them. Uh, Stephen Covey has a saying that I, to touch the soul of another human being is to walk on holy land. And when you make an impact in another individual and see what happens, get that in individual turned on, I tell you, that's what it is. Now, in order to accomplish all of this, uh, what do you need to do? Uh, you need to be passionate, persuasive, and caring. That's the charisma, the charisma that you need to have as an entrepreneur. Uh, Create a pro positive work environment. And what you want accomplished, and that's part of the culture, you have to repeat, repeat, and repeat. Uh, throughout the years, I was general manager at Orange County for about 20 years. And when I retired, they put together a slideshow of me uh, talking year after year. And my sideburns were long and they were short and over the years. And, and talking to people and how I would repeat, repeat I talk about values, our principles. I talked about how you should react when people come on the buses or on the rail. I mean, uh, you repeat, repeat, and you can, I can't tell you it. Uh, uh, and sometimes I would think to myself, I, I keep repeating myself all the time. You have to, because if you don't, they won't get it. And I can't tell how important it is, is to do that. 
uh, and appreciate culture diversity. It's uh, amazing how everyone can contribute to anything. People come from different backgrounds, and they can provide to you different their different ideas in terms of experience, what's going on, why it's going on. That's so uh, important. And keep things clear and simple. We make things so complicated that we, you know, you think about things, oh, you hear someone talk about it, it's so complicated, you can't understand. Keep it simple. One of the, one of the most interesting things, we, when I first went to uh, Los Angeles, head of operations, uh, our on-time performance was pitiful, just terrible. You know, people have a schedule. You schedule on buses, schedule on buses are parked, right? When is it going to be at what stop, at one time, what period? So I, I had all my division managers in there, and I said, uh, okay, now, what time do the buses leave the divisions in the morning? To get on their routes, they have to leave the division on time, you know, leave at 3 or 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. Are the buses leaving the divisions on time? I got a bunch of blank stares, okay? I One of the guys here at Quarry Orange County, he was one of the assistant managers of the division, and I said, okay, go out, find out if they're leaving on time. And... Uh, Okay, they weren't. They weren't. So we, uh, we started to measure that, where they're doing it. In six months, I increased, uh, uh, improved the on-time performance by 50% on the whole Los Angeles bus network. And, uh, and that's like 3,000 buses, okay, doing that. Simply and by starting on time. Starting on time. I mean, you know, and it, did it take his genius to figure that out? No. They start on time. Now, when that happens, and then what I said, I was looked at, my God, you created a miracle. It wasn't a miracle. You need a little common sense in this, too, <laughs> to get things done. I mean, it's amazing. Well, anyhow, there. And again, measure results uh, and uh, give rewards. Hey, if what you, you want to accomplish, give rewards if they're accomplishing it, and, 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 and make the corrections. And, and the other thing. Uh, when I first over, took over Orange County, we were fighting fires all the time. There was no time to anticipate problems. And we were fighting fires and nothing was getting done. We are just you're going around in circles. So you have to give yourself time to anticipate problems. And if you're fighting fires all the time, you don't have any time to antis anticipate the problems. Being a manager or a leader, you should spend your time anticipating problems so, and so that you're out there you know, putting barriers down so your people can proceed ahead without running into these problems. So one of the best things as a manager, anything, anticipate the problems, solve them before they become a problem, and that will help you speed up the process of what you're trying to achieve. So I can't tell you how important, how important it is to anticipate those problems. And... Uh, 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 and then the other thing uh, with that is using uh, uh, technology. You know yourself that you know you have to do more with less, and that's been the mantra over the you know last 20 years in terms of succeeding with business. Do more with how do you use you know, use technology? And obviously the most important thing of that is utilize high technology computers. Computers can do that work for you, and they, they can help you really get the job done. And uh, but again, it's all about you know working with people, uh, 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 helping them, anticipating things, uh, uh, taking a different a different view of things, and you're starting it all with uh, principles and values. Now, the last thing I want to talk about was kind of sustaining problems. How are we doing? Pretty good. Good, 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 good in time. Um, perspective. Uh, and knowing yourself, being energetic, uh, continually improve the things I've talked about. Have confidence to correct weaknesses. It's okay to say no. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they don't have the confidence to say no. And you better have that kind of confidence because if you can't say no, you're going to be in business long. And enjoying good health. You have to, enjoying good health is, is all part of it. You need to take care of yourself, uh, um, uh, you know, Working with people, uh, uh, you need to uh, do more about attending, uh, reading, attending seminars, schools. Uh, I can't tell you how important it is to have that increase of uh, uh, thirst for knowledge and traveling. I've done a lot of tra traveling help. I tell you, traveling broads your experience. 
and uh, you can see what happens in other in other lives and what's going on around the world. And traveling at the same time, it it gets you away. It, it gives you a chance to do something different in in, in a time period. And uh, how important you need a healthy diet. And I tell you, part of that is wine. Red wine is good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, hey. Uh, wine is healthy for you. And, and exercise, uh, how important it is. Uh, I remember when I was uh, doing a lot, uh, when I was started off as general manager of Orange County, uh, I would jog every morning. And uh, sometimes I have early meetings. I'd have to uh, get out early. I'd get out and jog earlier. It's a good stress reliever. Good stress. But sometimes I had early meetings. I couldn't do that. I'd get home at night. I'd say, you know, about, you know, six, seven o'clock, I'd be dead. And I'd say, well, I'd get, I'd get out and jog. Endorphins start, okay? You get out, I would, I'd be ter- I'd tired, I'd get out and jog, and I'd come home jogging, and I'd feel like a new person. And so I gotta tell you how important it is to uh, eat, a, a exercise, meditate, and, dre- and, and, and rest. And again, smell the rose. I, so many uh, times, that I'd, I'd be out talking with other managers, and I used to do a lecture scary, uh, series at UCI with the Graduate School of Management there, and we had people from all over the country come in, middle managers, and that was just, oh, to me, it's so rewarding to see lights turn on in the heads. I had people come up to me and, oh, they didn't like what they were doing. They were, I mean, I said, how can you not like? If you don't like what you're doing, get a new job. With the organization I'm with, it's not very good. Well, change it. Uh, Tom Peters had said, create your own little bubbles of excellence. He, in your own, if you can't do that, if the organization is not uh, there helping you out, go to another one. Uh, go and talk. Uh, talk. Find out what you're getting into when you go to these organizations. Uh, uh, you, you have to understand and, and be aware of what your environment is, what you're getting into yourself into and knowing, if anyhow, how to get out of it. And all part of that is understanding yourself as a person and understanding other people. I'd like to leave you with a uh, one thought. Uh, and, I, and I say it could kind of be the entrepreneur or prayer. Uh, that nothing that is worth doing can be done achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, or, therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. So it's hope, faith, and love. And that can be your entrepreneurial prayer. And Merry Christmas. Any any questions or any you know uh, yeah, things yeah, you well, might you, have? Yeah. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you have to create a lot of deals. You do a lot of dealing. Sure. Okay. So the question I got: Given the books you've read, have you read The Art of the Deal? And if so, what's your opinion of that? Uh, I've not read Art of the Deal by Trump. I've yeah. I've, I've heard enough from him to do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have to make deals, and and you have to uh, start with a. Uh, uh, a strong understanding of where you are and what you want to achieve. So I've not read that book, but uh, I'm sure it's uh, uh, probably best reading for the, an entrepreneur. I would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. And, uh, and, I, and I tell you, I, to, I kind of look at Trump now, I uh, don't want to get into politics, but uh, I like deal makers in, uh, in Washington. Mm-hmm. And uh, I like, uh, uh, people that have uh, know how to negotiate and you don't lay everything out on the table before you negotiate if you do you're not going to make a deal and I think that's what's happening now and that upsets a lot of people but uh, good they should be upset because they haven't got the job done so, how many other questions uh, servant leadership why don't you touch a little bit more on that what that means and in the context of uh, leading a uh, uh, entrepreneurial firm? Uh, it's helping people. It's all about helping people. Um, if you think about uh, a relationship to uh, 
people that are working with you or for you. It's being a servant to them. And it's a mindset because I can tell uh, people will help, help your managers, help the people that are working for you. And, and that's okay. And they'll think about that in terms of helping them. But if your mindset is being a servant to others, it changes their perspective. Okay, so you think about as being a servant leader as a mindset that then leads you to help other people to do better. And part of that helping is if, um, when I uh, took over in, in Los Angeles, I was uh, developing my team and I would tell them what I wanted them to do and we'd have an agreement, here's what I want you to do, okay, and then delegate, okay, we understand where I'm coming from, trust and all that stuff. Uh, I, I, I would ask them what issues are giving you problems or what is happening out there that is slowing you down, that doesn't allow you to do what we have agreed I want you to do. Okay, so what I'm trying to do then is to help them, be a servant to them, and anticipate now, if this issue is coming up, if that is going to be a problem, anticipate that so it doesn't become a problem. But that whole thing kind of fits together. But I, I, my mindset is, is in all of this is being a servant to those people around you. And I think that changes your perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How do you define the difference between a goal and... Pardon me? Dream, the difference between a dream and a goal difference between a dream and a the goal? Difference, yes. Um, I think a goal is uh, uh, a defining a dream. You have a dream. Okay, that could be at that. Okay, now you have to, it's nice to have a dream, okay, but if you want to achieve that dream, you better start to set some goals and objectives that defines that dream. I think I get that. Okay. So uh, a dream is uh, uh, almost organic, it's amorphous, and uh, the, the goal then becomes, you know, how do I, how do I achieve that dream? What yeah. are the things I need to do? Uh, what, what's how am I, when will I know that I've actually achieved it, right? Yeah, and you, you, I, I, from a broader down to narrowing it, and I get down to the narrow, narrowing it, what you want to uh, achieve, okay, that's when then, okay, then, uh, how then do I define success in that environment? And that's when I get down to how then do I uh, uh, track some key things that are happening key factors that I can then track and measure and then make corrections that are going that will again help me to achieve that dream. But if you just dream, you're never going to accomplish anything. You have to implement that dream and you implement that by goals, objectives, and then defining what you want to achieve and then track what you're trying to do and then that becomes your business cycle that never ends. You know, one, one comment on, on startups. There have been a number of studies that show that most startups are gone within three to five years. They just don't make it. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, gone doesn't mean that they went belly up necessarily. They could have been acquired by somebody. Sure. Okay. They're, they're no longer in the original entity that they start out with being. Okay. But there have been the studies, they list all the reasons why it happens. And you'll run out of money is a common one. But, but one of the high ones on the list is you didn't start out with the right team. Now, what comments do you have on insight to give these young people? I mean, I see them on campus here. I see them at Irvine. Okay. I see them at Chapman. And they all get their buddies. They say, let's get okay. together, and we're going to start this company together. Okay. okay. And then you find out later that it wasn't the right chemistry, okay? Okay. So, I want to get to know you as a person. 
So let's talk about it, go to lunch or go to breakfast. Say, you know, what, what do you believe in? You know, and what are your principles? What are your values? You know, what turns you on? You know, I mean, uh, what, are you, what are your values? Uh, get to know you as a person, okay? And that's part of my whole concept, if you will, then. You get to know a person's principles and values, okay? And then that, that turns into trust and communications. So if you're just out, like, putting some people together uh, without understanding who they are, and the only way you understand who they are is by their principles and values, now if they don't go that far and think that way, then they're going to put together a team that's not going to work because they're not going to work together because they don't have similar principles and values. And when you look at one of the studies came to pop in my mind, you were saying that uh, Fortune 500 did a study years ago why do CEOs fail? Okay, you know, it triggered me when you talk about some fail. And they did a whole study on that. It was really, they looked at the Japanese managers, they looked at everything. And one, the key reason that came out of that study, why do CEOs fail? They did not get rid of the deadwood quick enough. That's the other thing I talked about. But that was the key factor that came out of that Fortune 500 study. And, and if you no, if you got a team, mm -hmm. and, and, and again you got a team, are they working together? Okay, principles of value. If they're not, you better change a team member. It don't wait because otherwise you're going to be out of business in five years. If, if you understand the basic principles of where I'm going, are you going to succeed? No, but I say you play Las Vegas. Your chances of succeeding are going to increase. 80, 90 percent. Will ever be 100 percent? No, nothing is. But it'll get you over the 20, 30 percent or get you over the failure rate. So the comment that I was going to make is in a startup environment where you have limited resources and a small team, I think diversity within the team uh, rises as being a very critical element. So, you know, the, you, you, what, what triggers that thought is you talk about getting together with their buddies, okay? And although that compatibility is arguably uh, as merit, you need to have different skill sets. You need to have different experiences that uh, congeal into a team uh, along with a common uh, goal. So everybody has to have the, the, the same understanding of where they want to be. But I would argue diversity is uh, really important in a, very, in a small team environment. Whenever We see that here on campus with all these fast pitch contests we have, okay, and teams, especially in the classroom. Right. You know, I'm mentored in 465 A and B, and, and everybody kind of gets together, we form a team, okay, and certainly have diversity, what I've seen on campus, okay, but two to three or four years later, that same team moved forward, I'd reckon the guess is a different cast of characters, different set of faces, if they're, if they're going to succeed. Okay. I when, I, so. you know, when I'm putting a team together, I always try to get a contrarian with that team. Because, and, uh, and I was lucky to have two or three of them, I mean, uh, uh, what it amounts to is that we're at a staff meeting, we're, here's how we're going to do to do this. And all of a sudden, I got, my, my guy's <laughs> name was Stuart. Stuart would say, why are we doing this? Why, why, you know, you, why are we doing this way? Why, why, you know, this is crazy. I mean, okay, now, okay, good. why are you doing this? Okay, calm. then you get discussion. And then we were going this way, and all of a sudden, after discussion, people contributing and all that, we'd go a different way. This is a better way. And that's diversity, contrarian, whatever you want. And you got to get the inputs. I remember uh, when I first went to L.A., I'm head of operations. You know, it's like I've got 10,000 people reporting to me. i got a billion-dollar budget. Okay, I'm God. I'm walking up there, and, you know, it's kind of like this. I mean, I don't know everything. I mean, you know, I mean, you know I'd go, go to staffing because I had uh, uh, 13 bus divisions and a rail division. And I would say something, and everyone would go like this. And I, I mean, first couple of times I'm there, I said, this is ridiculous. I says, why are you guys agreeing with me all the time? Well, I don't know. why are we agreeing? I'm not, well, let me tell you this. Let me look right here. I said, if you're, I don't know all the answers. I admit it. If you're agreeing with me all the time, you're not contributing anything to me. And if you're not contributing anything to me, why do I need you? 
I'm going to fire you. I mean, just, I, if you're not contributing, I'm going to fire you. I got their attention. I start to get some <laughs> contributions in. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, why? It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, you know, uh, it's not as difficult as it seems. If you just, you know, come back to some basics and try to run through knowing yourself, understanding people and and how those dynamics work and how you work with them. And uh, it's fun, actually. I, I, I have so much fun working with the people and uh, uh, managing and uh, uh, that thing. Uh, it's, it's been, uh, I've had a good life, had a good life. Mika. <laughs> so share with us, please, what do you do in real life when people don't function or don't uh, meet your expectations. So th this can lead to two questions. Do people change or not? I mean, can you do things to people that will really change them and give you what you want? Or at the end of the day, the conclusion is that people don't change and you have to replace them? Uh, people can well, change. I believe they can change. Uh, you have to give them a chance. So if I have a problem with a, a person or manager that uh, I first try to do is to uh, uh, do some training. Okay, there may be some things that they may be deficient in that uh, we do some training on. And uh, then work with that person to try to get them to, uh, if you will, change their ways. And so you, you, you try to work that person to help them change their ways that they can make a contribution, okay? Now, how long do you give them? It varies with a person. Some can, will respond quickly and some not so quickly. So you got to give them a little rope, a little rope because uh, you're working with a person as life. You never want to destroy a person. But after a certain period of time, and what is that time? Depends if the person is making some progress or not. And I'd give uh, three months six months at, at the most before then I'd make some changes. But they have to show me that they are making some improvement before then I would take any drastic actions to get rid of them. Now, uh, I go back to the other thing. If you wait a year, you're waiting too long. And sometimes if the person is bad enough, you're talking about days and weeks. I mean, you have to. You come in a situation. I come in a situation. I evaluate things. Now, if I'm putting a team together, it's different. But I come in a situation. I'm making some evaluations. Sometimes you have to make some pretty quick evaluations, because. Uh, so again, I mean, it's. That's my take on it. In your prior life, what was the worst and most difficult situation you ever had to deal with? And how'd you handle it? Oh, ho, 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 prior life, first situation. Pick one. You probably have a number of them. Oh, one of them. I, I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, exercised me was when I first took over uh, as general manager of Orange County. Um, it was in disarray. I mean, it was, uh, everything was fighting a fire. And it was trying to get ahead of that and talking with the department heads then about how they couldn't just continually fight fires because we would never make any progress. And when we were we were just going in circles and how to get out of that circle. And I got them thinking about anticipating these things before they became problems. They says, you know, have to take time and one of the things you have to do as a manager, if you got people reporting to you, you have to delegate. And if you're not training people underneath you that you can delegate to, you've got a problem. Because if you're doing all the work, you can't anticipate the problem, so therefore you can't bash those problems down. So you have to anticipate those things to get that in their mindset so that they would then push down.
because one of the things they talk about is uh, the uh, 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 you have to push down because people will push up to let you solve all the problems. You have to push down by saying, how would you solve that problem? How would you solve that problem? And let them come up. Don't put, there's a saying, monkey on the back. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Okay. That's a management technique. You know, they don't want to solve the problems. They want to put it on your, pro uh, put it on your back. And if you let that happen, it's going to destroy you. A, a, good, a good friend of mine just become a, a CEO of a large organization. He had a bunch of presidents underneath him, and they were kicking it up to him. And I told the concept, the monkey on the back. I says, you push down. You push down. If they want to put, you know, you push down, you let them solve the problem. And I tell my managers, when I, one of the things I took over with, uh, I went to Orange County, they come in with an issue. I'm having a problem with my other director. I says, you get with the other guy, close the door and solve it. I says, you want to bring it to me? I says, I'll solve it, but you may not like the decision. They go down and solve it. Very often I would get it back. They'd take care of it. You got to push down. But I think the major, when I first, you know, the manager, it was getting out of that circle thing. And, you, and you know, everything's pushed up, pushed down. Get out of that uh, uh, circle and solve the problems that you're able to make. I call it going to warp speed. You know, if, if you're trying to move ahead in any project, you're hitting all these problems all the time, you're dead. Get rid of the problem, anticipate. So, Jim, you've been very generous today. What can we do for you? Oh, nothing. I just, um, it's a reward for me to get out and talk to all of you. I mean, uh, I've had years of experience and people say, why don't you write, write a book, write a book about all this stuff. I'm a terrible writer. You should be a good writer. You should, you should. And one of the things that helped me, too, is going to Toastmasters. I have to say, way back when, way back when, I tell you, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to me to be able to share some of this that I've, you know, done throughout my life and, and uh, maybe help you in what you're trying to do. That's my reward. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate so, it. Uh, you know, if you want to come up and shake Jim's hand, uh, really appreciate all you've done. Thank you very much. Thank you.